we come to Canto 5 in the Inferno, which is one of the most famous, partly because it's the first canto devoted to the theme of love, which is going to be so central to the unfolding of this odyssey that Dante is now fully embarked upon, and partly because it contains a famous encounter with Francesco de Rimini, a bit of poetry that many have competed to translate from Dante's original Italian, um, and so it's drawn a lot of attention to try and understand the subtleties of what's been communicated in this encounter, which in a way is the, the central theme of the canto. We think we know what love is, love is all you need, um, love makes the world go round, all those kind of sentiments uh, which were really building up in the medieval period um, around Dante's time with the birth of courtly love, which is the predecessor to romantic love as we think of it now. And yet already Dante's on to, we think we know what love's about as if it's some kind of panacea or magic, um, but do we understand it? And this is what, Cante, what Dante, the pilgrim, wrestles with in this canto. And ultimately, at this point in his descent, doesn't actually understand. Now it begins with um, them seeing the figure of Minos, um, the mythical king of Crete, um, who appears both in Virgil's poetry um, and now in Dante's as well. Um, he is a wise judge. Um, he understands the hearts and souls of men and women. And so he's positioned here, um, showing um, the hearts, uh, showing souls where they're going to end up in hell, um, but in a kind of grotesque way. Um, the image is that he wraps his tail um, around him. He's got a tail now. And the number of times he wraps his tail around him um, is the number of circles you're going to have to descend into hell before you as a damned soul find your place. Um, so it's this kind of horrible, sort of frightening image. You can kind of imagine the souls waiting there, you know, one wrap, two wrap, three wrap. How long is this going to go on for? Um, and, um, you know, if it wasn't sort of so horrendous, it would almost be comical as well. Um, and I think this is sort of stressing how Minos um, does judge, does see, has a kind of wisdom, but it's not a wisdom that's ultimately informed by love. Um, rather, it's a kind of fatalistic or necessary justice kind of judgment, this more legalistic approach, which I think Dante is beginning to sort of tease apart um, and which is going to become so um, necessary, really, if the notion of hell is to be transcended. So here we sort of see it um, in a brutal, almost caricatured form. Um, and sure enough, Virgil, who in the poem um, stands for the sort of older ways of understanding things, he too sense, tends to see justice as a matter of moral account or right and wrong um, in this rather legalistic, uh, judgmental way. Um, he speaks harshly to Minos as if sort of caught up um, in this rather um, unloving, uh, rigorous, um, concrete, you might say, way of understanding things. Minos says, what's Dante doing here? He's living. And Virgil says, um, step to one side, Minos, you've got to obey what he who, who wills from above um, wills. Um, the whole mood at the beginning of the canto um, is rather unloving, rather um, concrete and, uh, um, and, and legalistic. Um, so that, that sort of flags up um, that, that mood of life, um, which is a hellish state of affairs rather than understanding and seeing, which allows for changing and the descent to become an ascent. So that's to come. Um, they then start to hear the souls um, in this state um, and uh, it's an infernal storm. There are cries of anguish. Um, and this starts to show Dante what this state of love gone wrong is like. Um, it sweeps people along um, in um, strange perversions of winds, which are, uh, of course, um, in, you know, in, in older understanding, the wind and the spirit and the breath are all part and parcel of the same thing. So this is a perverse kind of wind, a perverse kind of spirit, um, the lust of love that sweeps people along in ways that ultimately leads nowhere um, and uh, doesn't reveal or show anything. It just keeps them trapped. Um, the image which is given is a bit like star starlings in a murmuration. Um, and there is something um, slightly uh, satanic about a murmuration. Um, it's uncanny. I mean, how is this going on? And it's black and it, it moves and, and changes shape. Um, it's a very sublunary kind of thing to observe. 
um, it, its beauty has this kind of strange taint, which I think is partly why um, it grabs us so much. And sure enough, Dante finds himself being drawn in and, and captured um, by um, this kind of state of love gone wrong that all these souls um, are caught up in. It's a state described as reason when it's a slave to the passions. In other words, um, appetites and lusts mean that reason can't operate. There's no freedom, there's no will, there's no way of negotiating it. You do just get swept along. And this is a very powerful way of describing it now in our times because this is the description that David Hume, the Enlightenment philosopher, philosopher um, gave to um, the relationship between reason and passion. He famously remarked that um, reason is a slave to the passions. And I think it's, it's kind of illuminating and worth just pondering on for a moment and because it's not just saying, you know, that there's a part of us, our kind of emotional side of you life, if you like, which can be much more powerful than reason, which is true. Um, but it's also now to show how this, the understanding of reason has become um, too thin, too truncated. Because in the older understanding, certainly in the ancient world, and I think still very powerfully in the medieval world at Dante's time, Reason wasn't just kind of logic. It wasn't just this mechanical do this, don't do that, um, kind of rather heady understanding. Reason had a much deeper connection with life because it was also about resonance. It was also about harmony. Um, it was also about tuning in to the deeper patterns of the world around us, um, the deeper way that the cosmos moves so that gradually the soul could be aligned to the soul of the whole world. And of course, in a theistic context, this means that reason is ultimately the way that God himself, God's self moves within all things. And so to be rational is not just, as it were, to uh, make a logical decision, um, which, of course, passion can easily um, overwrite. Um, reason itself has a kind of felt quality um, when it's learnt um, over time. Um, to move with the way the divine life moves. And the Stoics called it the Logos, um, the word that speaks life. Um, and so moving with that life is what reason can achieve as well. So Dante is saying um, uh, that this is what love's got to do. Love and reason are actually part and parcel of the same thing. And that when love and uh, reason get disconnected, love becomes lust. And maybe for us now, and when love and reason become disconnected, reason just becomes this rather mechanical, logical thing, which is often taken to be today, um, and loses touch with this deeper sense of gradually finding a way into the harmony, the resonance, tuning in to the deepest currents of the cosmos and of the divine, the ultimate goal of the divine comedy. We then start to see some of the lovers um, who have caught in this trap for whom uh, this disconnection, this perversion really has occurred. Um, and I just want, it's the first of the great kind of roll calls um, in the Divine Comedy. And when you get um, a series of both real historical figures and also mythological figures um, being um, seen by Dante, being named by Virgil and Dante. So it's just worth saying something about that because it, it's one of the moments when the comedy can become quite confusing. Um, because these figures are recognised or not recognised, and when they are recognised, Dante seems to be doing something else with them than what you'd expect. Um, I think that this is about naming, starting to discern um, and to tease apart the different kinds of love that can exist. You know, we have this one word for love, the ancient Greeks have many words for love, um, and to understand and attune with love aright, is to be able to discern the different degrees of love, the different kinds of love. And the way that Dante does this is by associating different names, different people with different kinds of love. Um, you may think that's rather unjustified um, given the person that you know that's named in this way. Well, um, that may well be so, but what you're doing there is you're readjusting the name and the kind of love, which in a way is what Dante wants you to do. He wants you to, to name it, to understand it, to see it. Um, because you know that's what naming can do and I work as a psychotherapist and sometimes people someone might arrive and say you know I'm suffering from anxiety uh, one word that covers many many different things and you know that one of the first things you're going to have to try to understand is what kind of anxiety is this um, is this an anxiety that results from a kind of trauma from fear um, is it an anxiety that results from perhaps an internalized anger um, that's got trapped inside and so is frightening um, you know, anxiety can be many, many different things, and so can love too. 
Um, and so Dante starts to name them here in order that we can understand more and more about them. And what's also really wonderful about this is that um, at the beginning of the canto, um, it had been remarked that as they descend um, down the circles of hell, they're in the second circle of hell now, the space um, becomes more constricted. Um, you know, the, the hell, is, hell is envisaged as a kind of funnel. Um, but I think this is as much a psychological comment as it is supposed to be a physical comment. Um, this, we're in this imaginal zone, um, this kind of psychophysical zone, um, where what we see um, affects what we feel um, and what we think is there. Um, as much as as well what is more objectively there as we try to um to to get it in in the, in the straightforward worlds in which we live and um, as you go into these more inner worlds um those dis distinctions become blurred um and so the space becomes more confined as they descend into hell um and the, the pain as it were intensifies it feels tighter and trapped um but of course when you start to name things that's actually the antidote um to feeling tight and constrained and trapped because when you name it gives a space and a place for this kind of love and a space and a place for that kind of love and so already um, in this early canto we're getting indications as to how we can the soul can expand even as it descends and so can look um, at all that can go wrong um, but stay outside of all that goes wrong as well by by seeing by understanding um, that's going to be a key way that Dante has to grow through the descent in order that he can then move into the very different zone of purgatory. Um, so these roll calls can be confusing but they're, they're key because I think psychologically speaking and spiritually speaking they enable a world that feels constrained to actually open up once more um, and then that is very much part of the descent turning into an ascent. So Dante the poet is giving us an early indication of this, even as he describes Dante the pilgrim getting more and more confused. So here are some of the, the names that get rolled off at this point, some of the, um, the lustful lovers that have got caught in the second circle of hell. And um, the first one we meet is um, the Babylonian empress called Semiramis. Um, she, you might say, had such a lust for life um, that when she restored Babylon, um, she turned it into a kind of monstrous hellish place. Um, we meet Dido, um, the lover of Aeneas, who of course is very close to Virgil's heart. Um, and you might say that Dido loved a man too much, so that when Aeneas leaves, she kills herself. Um, it's quite striking that she's in this circle of hell and not in the lower circle, where we're going to meet people who've committed suicide. Another very, very difficult thing to talk about and to negotiate, um, to discern what really is going on in suicide. Um, we'll come to that. Um, but for now, Dido is in this slightly... Um, higher circle of hell. I think because her real problem was that she loved too much, not that she actually um, killed herself. Um, and so she got too focused, you might say, on the one man and um, couldn't see that that was actually um, a, a seed for a kind of love that could grow. Um, uh, she loved too much, you might say, in too narrow a way, rather than loving too much in the sense of wanting more and more and more of life. And so when Aeneas leaves and um, she feels that she has to die, um, that's Dido's uh, sort of problem with love and um, that keeps her confined in hell in Dante's account. And we meet Achilles, um, the great hero um, of um, the Iliad. Um, and um, I think Achilles' problem is that his love, um, particularly for um, his, his companion um, Patroclus, um, is that uh, it takes him in a kind of death spiral when Patroclus gets killed by Hector, um, Achilles goes on a killing spree and kills um, Hector, um, but then of course Achilles himself is killed in turn um, by Paris, and so this is love that turns into a kind of spiral of death going down and down and down, so Achilles too um, is in this circle of hell. So by contemplating the, these names you start to see the different kind of loves and what can go wrong um, that, that Dante is pointing out, you know, from a lust for life, from loving one person too much and so actually not loving enough in a perverse kind of way, from love turning into a kind of death spiral of vengeance. These are all the ways that love can start to go wrong that Dante is trying to see. Dante, the poet, says that they see a thousand of these souls um, that Virgil patiently names to him. And this is a real attempt to teach Dante the Pilgrim something. Um, they're summarised as those whom love has cut off from life. Um, very powerful statement, you know, love can do that and we feel it's taking us into life and actually it's cutting us off from life. 
Now I wonder whether Dante privately is thinking about his early love for Beatrice in this canto, um, this infatuation um, that in a way supercharged his life and in some ways led to so much his earlier poetry, but now he's beginning to question that. Did it actually cut him off from life? And is that something he's gonna have to try and learn? And how confusing is that? Um, and then Dante sees one soul in particular, um, Francesco de Rimini and her beloved in life, Paolo. And he asked to speak to them. And this is a chance uh, for us to have a kind of encounter to learn more directly as readers um, how love can go wrong. Um, and it's this very, very powerful section of the poem um, that others have tried to translate. Now, Francesco de Rimini um, was well known for having um, had an affair with her brother-in-law, um, the brother of her husband. And here it's described as happening in this way that um, uh, like kind of courtly lovers gone wrong, um, they were sharing in some courtly love. In fact, the story of Lancelot, Lan Lancelot and, and Genevieve, and they were reading a great poem of, of, of medieval love to each other. Um, but, um, says Francesco, um, it led to them actually having an affair. They as it were, were seized by love. It possessed them and, and caused them to have this affair, which now has led to their condemnation. Now, I don't think it's just the legalistic fact that um, she had an affair with her brother-in-law and that's really at stake here. We're pushing for this more deeper um, insight and understanding. And what you could say about Francesco using modern language, uh, particularly psychotherapeutic language, um, is that she um, is um, narcissistic um, in this particular sense that her struggle with love um, leads her to make many, many mistakes in love. And that's what narcissism means, um, really. It doesn't mean um, that you love yourself, but you don't know how to love. You don't know how to love yourself. So it traps you in kind of cycles. Um, that's why people who are narcissistic are difficult to be with, in fact. So this comes up um, in this section of the poem, not just when Francesca says that love seized her, a word that's used three times really to stress that, um, you know, kind of possessive, destructive, spiralling down kind of love. Um, but also she uses her poetry and she does speak in a very poetic way about love, um, again, discombobulating you, to try and charm Dante, um, which she does. Um, uh, Dante gets drawn into what Francesca is saying. He gets confused about whether it's true or not. Um, she tells lies about what actually happened. Um, readers of the poem originally would have known that Francesca is distorting the truth of the story. Um, and it's left hanging. Is she deliberately telling lies? Has she become um, self-deceiving? She herself has lost touch with what's true or false anymore. Certainly a state that love can lead you into. Um, she blames even the book they were reading, the poetry they were reading, and rather than taking responsibility for herself, um, she feels that she was um, possessed by this love and so can only really blame that. She can't gain in self-understanding about what happens to her, which is this often very painful and difficult attempt to gain self-understanding. She, she's beyond that and hence finds herself in the second circle of hell. It's really interesting that this love, which was supposed to have so powerfully impacted her life, her love of Paolo, um, she doesn't name Paolo here. He's just called the one. And in the poem, we just see him trapped in self-pity, weeping and crying. He's a kind of pitiful figure. Um, I think what this is saying is that for, for Francesca, Paolo wasn't even a real person. Um, he was maybe this sort of object of infatuation, maybe this very beautiful man, um, but she didn't really see the soul. And that's another thing that love can do um, in these kind of infatuated states. We just see, we just have a, love for the, a lust for the physical body and don't go on beyond that. And, and now they're in hell where Paolo doesn't have a physical body anymore. She can't even name him. Remember the importance of naming things. She can't see him. She, don't, she can't get beyond the blindness of love, the madness of the love that seized her. Um, she also expects empathy from Dante. She expects Dante to understand, and, and Dante, sure enough, gets quite drawn into this. But it's a kind of empty empathy because it's all about sentimentality and feeling, and there's none of this understanding or reason. There's no sense of how um, love actually should try and align itself with a deeper current than just the immediacy of the kind of the falling in love moment, um, which happens, but which must be got over. Um, it's not to say it doesn't happen or shouldn't happen, but it's not the end point. Um, it's the beginning um, of a path into a wider love. 
Um, and Dante um, gets caught up in uh, Francesca's narcissistic expectations that she'll just empathise with him, she'll have sympathy on him, um, with him. She captures Dante um, in this trapped state, in this whirlwind, this infernal anguish um, that love can become. Um, I love um, the phrase of William Blake, you know, who so powerfully contemplated the Divine Comedy as well, and which I think captures this different. He makes this famous couplet, he says, he who binds to himself the joy, binds to himself the joy, does the winged life destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies, lives in eternity's sunrise. Um, and that notion that love doesn't have to seize, doesn't have to possess, but actually can fly with life, um, and so live in eternity's sunrise, um, is at the heart um, of what this canto is wrestling with, I think. But Dante doesn't get it. Um, he struggles to understand. He gets caught up um, in the whirlwind too, um, and so ends up swooning once more at the end of this canto. He collapses, drops to the floor of the second round of hell as if he were dead. Um, he is overwhelmed. He's on the descent. Um, he can't grasp um, the nuances and the subtleties of love. It's all come sort of too fast, too soon um, at the end of this canto, and so his descent must continue.